All right. So th thanks very much, Fred, for a, a really nice talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, so um, what I'm going to tell you about today is some work that we've been doing over the last, well, I won't admit how many years, but it's been a while. Um, and it's, we've been looking at how cells swim in viscosity gradients. Um, and um, I'll, I'll go through, I'll, I'll, I know we have a pretty diverse crowd here, so I'll give sort of a little, a little overview and sort of the history of this topic. Um, and then I'll tell you about some of our, our new results. And I'll, I'll try to put it in some terms that we can all understand, um, like traffic jams and, and U-turns. Um, I should probably get rid of this guy on my screen here. Sorry, give me one second. Uh-oh. Let me get rid of this. We see your screen, right? Just, just okay. fine. Okay, great. Just a little slow on my end, sorry. Okay. Um, so before I um, tell you about the story, this is a, just give credit to uh, the folks that, that did the work. Um, so it's mainly due to my senior PhD student, Michael Stanach, and my former postdoc, Nicholas Wasteboard, who's now at REN, um, and also my former PhD student, uh, Derek Walkema. Um, and all of this was funded by the NSF. Um, so some of the, the work, of, this is kind of the, the inverse of Fred's talk, so I'll tell you a little bit about some of the other things that we do in my group. Um, very broadly, um, we're, we're interested in lots of different things that span um, soft matter and biophysics, things like flagellar mechanics and chemotaxis. Um, we do a lot of work on um, environmentally relevant problems like bacterial transport um, in the environment and, and how cells move around in fluid flows. Um, we've also started some work recently on um, uh, non-Newtonian flows in uh, porous media environments. Um, and some of the common themes that we have uh, that, that sort of run through all of this work um, are the tools that we use, so microscopy and high-speed imaging, um, and as you'll see today, uh, microfluidics as well. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, cells not that grow, as, as we're in Fred's talk, but rather we're going to focus on cells' movement. Um, and so um, we, we often think about two sort of canonical types of cells, so prokaryotes and eukaryotes, and, and um, uh, their um, different types of movement sort of uh, correspond very coarsely um, to these two categories. Um, in prokaryotes, um, something that most of you have probably heard about is um, what's called run and tumble motility. Um, and so this is where um, cells like E. coli, which are about a micron in size, they spin their um, uh, roughly rigid um, helical flagella, which bundle together into what looks like kind of a superhelix. And that allows the cells to swim uh, essentially in a straight line. And then when one or more of these flagella um, change their rotation sense, um, that breaks apart this bundle. Um, and when the bundle reforms, it sends the cell off in some new direction. Um, eukaryotes do something similar as well. Um, this is Chlamydomonas renardi. This is the, the star of the show today that I'll, I'll focus on later on in the talk. Um, this is a eukaryote, and this happens to be a biflagellate. So you see the two, uh, the two flagella out front on this guy. Um, and um, when these guys swim in a straight line, um, they're essentially beating their flagella in a synchronous way, right? So with this um, breaststroke type motion. Um, and then when they turn, um, they do so a bit more deliberately than, uh, than E. coli. Um, they, they sort of beat one flagellum a little bit faster than the other. Um, this is known as a phase slip. And uh, this results in the cells basically executing some kind of sharp turn. Um, but something that's common between all of these um, different types of cells is that um, if you zoom out, they all essentially search their environment by some kind of random walk, right? Um, and um, typically, we like to, uh, to quantify their, their, their motility um, with a diffusion coefficient. So if it's a random walk, like a random walk polymer um, or Brownian motion, um, it's, it's nice to be able to quantify that with a diffusion coefficient. Um, and that's nice most of the time, um, but there are some situations where um, other um, physics comes into play that can bias the cell's motion um, and it sort of breaks this, this nice model of this unbiased random walk. 
Um, and here I'm referring to things like chemotaxis, which can direct cells um, in different directions, um, as well as many other different types of taxis like phototaxis um, or physical taxis like gravitaxis or magnetotaxis. Um, today we're going to talk about something a little bit different, um, which is called viscotaxis. And the question that we're trying to answer here is, is what are the physical mechanisms that control cell motility in inhomogeneous viscous environments? So that is in an environment where the, the, the material properties of the fluid are changing in space. How does that couple to the cell's motion? Um, and how does it couple to the cell's transport on sort of the ensemble scale? Um, I have a lot of slides. I don't think I'll get through all of them. Um, so. Um, I'll try to pick a good stopping point. Um, but um, some of the motivation for this work comes from uh, the fact that cells, you know, we, we often uh, in the lab uh, put cells in sort of these ideal, idealized environments that are very homogeneous. We typically think of cells swimming around far away from surfaces and, and things like that. Um, in reality though, um, cell, the, the environments that cells swim around in are very messy. And so part of the goal of our lab is to try to add more realism to um, modeling cell motility and, and their interactions with the physical environment. Um, so one, one um, really interesting phenomenon that's known um, is um, in, uh, in the human stomach, um, Helicobacter pylori, H. pylori, um, is known to, it's known as the source of, of uh, gastric ulcers. Um, and basically they, they uh, do this by infecting um, the inner lining of the stomach. Um, and to accomplish that, they, they do this really interesting thing where they have to penetrate through this mucus gel-like layer. So it's a very high viscosity. And they have a cool trick to do this, which is that they actually change the local pH and sort of dissolve the mucin. Um, and then they're able to swim a little bit more easily through, um, through this sort of uh, mucus layer. Um, similar things are seen in the environment on, on corals. Corals are coated with, uh, with mucus that they use um, for particle capture and for feeding. Um, uh, and um, other environments um, that you see that have um, sort of non-homogeneous viscosities um, are typically in biofilms. So when cells are living together in relatively high density, um, they'll often exude um, various uh, polymers that can locally increase the viscosity. And so you have this very typical situation where you have a low viscosity fluid like water um, up against some very high viscosity fluid like mucus or, or biofilm. Um, and that's sort of the physical situation that we're, we're trying to investigate from a really fundamental uh, sort of level. Um, we know a lot about how cells swim uh, or how, how um, viscosity and um, uh, fluid rheology affects cell motility. Um, there's some very nice work from Paolo Aradia's group at the University of Pennsylvania, where um, they put cells like Chlamydomonas into um, fluids that are Newtonian um, and fluids that are non-Newtonian, that's viscoelastic. Um, and what they observe is that the, the, um, the nature of the, the fluid, even under the same viscosity, can modulate um, the mechanics of their flagella and, and can change the beat pattern. Um, a, a, another more sort of fundamental effect is, is really simply that um, if you increase the viscosity of the fluid, you can actually change the transport properties of the cells. Namely, if you increase the viscosity, the cells tend to slow down um, and um, they swim slower. Um, there's also some work that, that predates this by quite a lot. Uh, we owe a lot to Howard Berg, of course, um, at Harvard. Um, and uh, back in the late 70s, um, they showed that if you put bacteria into fluids of, of increasing viscosity or different viscosity, um, that their, their cell body um, rotation slows down. Um, here they show the rotation rate of the cell body versus fluidity. Fluidity is the inverse of viscosity. So increasing viscosity is going kind of from right to left. And so as you increase the viscosity, the rotation rate decreases. And so the cell swimming speed decreases. That's a pretty simple thing to understand, I think. Um, uh, and then around the same time, this is the, the sort of history lesson for today. Um, around the same time, there were a few really curious um, studies um, that were they're pretty innovative at the time where um, a few different groups started to look at what does 
a, a non-uniform, a spatially non-uniform viscosity due to cell motility. And so there were some really nice experiments at the time where um, they basically created some inhomogeneous environment, so some locally enhanced viscosity, um, typically in a capillary tube or something like that. Um, and then they would dip these capillary tubes into a suspension of cells and count how many cells got into the capillary tube. Um, so pretty standard kind of assay, but um, uh, rather interesting that they were looking at viscosity. And uh, most of these experiments were done with bacteria. And a few groups said, well, you know, if you, if you do this with bacteria, um, they, the cells um, uh, go toward higher viscosity or they have positive viscotaxis, um, as they termed it. Um, and that sounds perhaps like a reasonable thing. Um, and then there were some other groups that said, well, no, there, there's actually a lot of these cells actually do negative viscotaxis. So even for the same cells, they saw some more positive viscotactic, some more negative viscotactic. Um, and they were sort of limited by a lot of the technology at the time um, where they couldn't really quantify what the viscosity was locally. And there was a lot of sort of inference um, and the observations were, were pretty rudimentary. All they could really do is count cells in a capillary tube or something like that. Um, and then uh, more recently, 40 years later, um, this um, topic became en vogue again. Um, and so a, a few different groups started doing simulations of swimming cells using some very simple models, almost toy models, um, where they showed that, well, actually you can see positive or negative viscotaxis depending on um, the cell geometry, right? And um, uh, they, uh, these are a couple of the, the different studies over the last few years. Um, but uh, you know, overall, they, they kind of ignore a lot of um, really potentially important effects, like the fact that the cells slow down in high viscosity, um, and also the fact that the cells swim in, uh, there's some random character to the cell's motility, so random walks. Um, and so this is what kind of motivated us to do a, a more systematic study of, of what's going on. Um, and so what we did was we focused on um, Chlamydomonas renardi. Uh, this is a workhorse uh, model cell in genetics and, and also in fluid mechanics. Um, and we started out pretty simple. Uh, what we did was um, to simply um, uh, repeat some of these experiments where we increase the viscosity and we observe um, the swimming speed of the cells. And so um, at low viscosity, the cells swim pretty fast, uh, 100 microns per second. For these guys, it's about 100 body lengths per second. Um, and then um, as you increase the viscosity, well, the cells slow down, right? Pretty intuitive. So here we use um, uh, polyethylene oxide, uh, which the cells don't metabolize. They don't chemotax to or anything like that. Um, and there's this really nice relationship of uh, the, the swimming speed is inverse to the fluid viscosity. And that's kind of consistent with a, a sort of constant power output of the, the flagella, at least in this regime. All right. But the real question is, well, what do these cells do in a viscosity gradient? All right. So the first challenge there is that we have to make a gradient. Um, and so my student and postdoc came up with this very simple method. Um, it's a, a, basically the way that you make a gradient um, of, uh, for a, a chemotaxis assay. We do the same thing here for viscosity. So we have a microfluidic channel about one uh, millimeter wide. Uh, we bring in media from one side and uh, media with some uh, polymer from the other side. Um, and then um, uh, the, uh, the polymer is on the left where there's high viscosity and there's no polymer on the right, so it's low viscosity. Um, and we have to quantify what the viscosity profile is first. So here we just put in some tracer particles. You can see that they jiggle around a little bit in the high viscosity they jiggle around a lot more in the low viscosity. Um, and so you could use some tools from microrheology to relate the um, viscosity locally of, uh, of the uh, fluid to the diffusion coefficient of these particles. And so we break up the channel into a couple of different bins, about 10 or so bins. Um, we measure the mean square displacement of the particles. Um, and then from the slopes of the mean squared displacements, you can back out what the local viscosity is, right? So this is pretty straightforward. Um, and so um, this is an, an inherently unsteady process because the uh, PEO polymer is diffusing over time. And so we start off with this nice step function. And then over time, as the, um, as the polymer diffuses across, um, you can see that this approaches some kind of sort of linear, um, uh, quasi-linear um, viscosity profile 
Um, and it's in this regime that we do um, the, the studies that I'll show you in just a second. All right. Um, so the next thing that we do is we add cells to the mix and we try to see how, um, how this affects the cell motility. Um, so um, it's pretty obvious here that in the high viscosity zone, the cells are swimming slow. On the right side, uh, they're swimming pretty fast. Um, and what we really want to know is where do the cells spend their time? Where are they transported to in this environment? And so what, what logic would tell us is that wherever the cells swim slowest is where they should accumulate, all right? So this is the traffic jam, right? So you know if you're driving down the highway and there's a, a police officer on the side of the road and everyone slows down, cars get closer together and they slow down, but essentially the flux remains the same. All right, so it's the same case here. There's no cell-cell interaction, but wherever you swim slow, you accumulate. And this has been shown directly. These are some beautiful experiments from um, Roberto de Leonardo's group at La Sapienza. Um, and what they were able to do is they, they used a, um, a mutant of E. coli that slows down proportionally to the light intensity that you shine on them. Um, and so what they were able to do is where they shine a bright light, the cells swim very slowly. That's this picture on the right, the swimming speed. Um, and that's consequently where they accumulate. That's the bright region on the left. And of course, you know, if you're at La Sapienza, what do you do is, well, you, you use the Mona Lisa for your experiments, which is beautiful. All right, so that's what we would expect for our cells. Um, but the problem is we don't see that. So if you watch this video closely, there's a lot more cells on the right than there is on the left. Okay, and this, this caught our attention. This was pretty curious. Um, so what we had to do is we went through this problem systematically and we, we, we looked at a bunch of different gradients of the viscosity. Um, and we, we looked at where are the cells, where are they spending their time and how fast are they moving? All right, so here are the different viscosity gradients. We go from zero to something reasonably high. Um, and then we look at the swimming speed of the cells. This makes sense. So the cells swim slowly in the high viscosity region. They swim fast in low viscosity, right? Um, we can model this actually just using this very simple relationship because we know the viscosity profile, we can predict what the swimming speed should be. And that's what these dotted lines are. And you can see that that matches up quite nicely um, for such a simple idea, it matches really well. Um, the problem is that when you start to look at the cell density, the concentration, um, it doesn't really behave as you would expect. Um, so there is a slight accumulation of cells in the, low vis in the high viscosity zone, but it's rather underwhelming, right? So the, the models typically over predict what we see. And even more interesting is that when you go to very high gradients, um, this, in, this, this relationship is actually inverted. So the cells actually go toward the low viscosity re region. Um, and the question that we, we came up on is, well, why does this happen? So to figure this out, you have to look at the cell kinematics. You have to look at how the cells are actually moving in space. Um, and so here, what we've done is we've, we've kind of pre-selected cells that are swimming perpendicular to the gradient, okay? So the, the viscosity gradient varies from left to right. And here we have cells that are swimming vertically, perpendicular to that gradient. So if there's no gradient, and then they basically just swim in a straight line um, until their persistence, their natural persistence time, which makes sense. Um, and then if we do this in a gradient, you see something rather striking, which is there, there's this sort of avoidance behavior. So the cells actually swim away from um, this high viscosity zone. Um, you could look at this a little bit closer and ask, well, you know, is, is there a directional response? Do they, do they change their behavior depending on the direction? Um, and the answer is yes. So if, if you look at the um, rotation rate, the angular velocity of the cells um, as a function of their orientation, without a gradient, it's a flat line. And then in the gradient, there's this kind of sinusoidal looking response, right? So they turn really strongly or very fast when they're perpendicular to the gradient. But if they're swimming up or down the gradient, they actually don't really rotate much at all. They don't turn much at all. Um, so that's really curious. And, and one of the questions was, well, is this a mechanosensory response or is it a passive kind of physical response? Uh, since we're physicists, the, the thing that we kind of default to is, well, can we make a physical model that replicates this behavior? And I'll, I'll spare you the details because I don't have a ton of time. Um, but suffice it to say, um, if, you, if you just look at this, this little diagram on the right, um, 
as a very simple concept, we, we model the cell as sort of three point forces. So we have one that represents the body and then one each for the two flagella. And very simply, if you, if you take this idea that um, the, uh, if the two flagella are moving in the same way with the same kinematics, um, then um, the flagellum that experiences the higher viscosity, if it moves at the same rate as the one in the low viscosity, then it will exert a stronger force, right? And because there has to be um, no net forces on this thing, um, there's, a, there's a torque that's exerted by this difference in the propulsive force of the two flagella. And so you can carry through the math analytically. It's, it's quite satisfying to do this. Um, and what you arrive at um, after you go through all of this, you can actually come up with an expression for the angular velocity omega of the cell, um, which looks like this. And so there's, there's a piece here that depends on the geometry of the cell, the radius and the length of the flagella, um, the swimming speed of the cell, V, the gradient that they experience, the viscosity gradient normalized by the, the viscosity, um, and then um, you have a sine theta term, right? So this is the thing that we're really interested in, right? Um, and just from the, the physical picture of this thing, you can realize that the torque on the cell is maximized when they're swimming perpendicular to the gradient. That is when one flagellum experiences a maximally high viscosity compared to, excuse me, compared to the other one. Um, what's really cool about this is that you see this kind of directional response um, in other types of taxis, um, namely in magnetotaxis and gravitaxis. Um, but that's typically when there's an external field that's exerting a torque on the cells. Um, here, the torque is simply due to the self-propulsion of the cells, which is rather novel, I think. Um, and so um, if we take this, this little model that we have, um, well, we know that the rotation rate um, should vary like the sine. And so the, this thing out front is, is a constant, right? This big term out here is a constant for a given cell and a given gradient. Um, and so we can fit a sine function to our data and you can see that does a pretty good job. Um, and so we can parameterize um, this response, which is this constant omega visc that we get from, from fitting this thing. Um, let me see. Um, and so uh, what really kind of convinced us that, that this was the, the right way forward is that if you do this for lots of different viscosity gradients, uh, what you find is that there's a linear relationship between this turning rate amplitude, omega visc, um, and this normalized viscosity gradient, right? So that, that's, that's about as straight of a line as I've ever seen in biophysics. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, now, one of the other interesting things about this is that um, there's a, a geometric factor in here. Um, so this prefactor contains all of the geometry of the cell that's important, right? The cell radius and basically the length of the flagella. Um, and one of the things that you can realize is that um, this, th this geometry, the cell geometry, it can actually control the magnitude of this effect. Um, and um, it can even result in negative visco, or sorry, in positive viscotaxis. So here, what we've seen is positive, is negative viscotaxis, excuse me, um, where the cells turn toward the low viscosity direction. Um, but if you, if you balance this term, you can identify that there's actually a critical dimension of the cell, dimensionless parameter, um, which is sort of the, uh, the, the flagellar length divided by the cell radius, where if this parameter is above 0.6, cells should turn toward the low viscosity side. Um, and you can confirm this for Clamidomonas. It turns out that um, the, uh, the flagellar length divided by the radius is about one. Um, and so this, this holds for these cells. Um, the nice thing about Clamidomonas is that since it's, it's so well utilized by geneticists, there are lots and lots of different mutants out there that we can have access to and play around with. And so one of the fun things that we did was you can get a mutant that has short flagella, right? Um, and so these are 36% shorter flagella. And so you calculate that this ratio D over R is about 0.7. Um, so that's greater than 0.6. So the cells should still turn toward the low viscosity zone. 
but with a much diminished response. And that's exactly what we see. So it's still a roughly linear relationship, um, but we see this very diminished response. All right. Um, so I see I'm just about at time, and I, I think this is a good stopping point. I'm, I'm happy to elaborate on, um, on any of these points um, you know, during the discussion or the question period. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll just stop there and, uh, and take any questions that Nerese has. Okay, thank you very much. That was very interesting. There are a few questions. Um, sure. So, Jin Hua is asking if the viscotaxis is related to the observation by Berg and others that the flagellar motor switching is load dependent. And I suppose, I suppose he's talking about bacterial um, viscotaxis. Yeah, so that, that's a little bit, it's a little bit different here because we're, we're dealing with eukaryotes that, that don't really exhibit that. Um, and all things considered, the viscosities that we're dealing with are relatively mild. Um, so it's not a huge load on the flagella. Um, in these experiments, that was kind of done on purpose because it's kind of consistent with the environments that these guys live in. Um, and also um, their flagella don't seem to deform too much under those conditions. Um, we have looked at um, the, um, th there is another big part to this story, which is that we've also looked at um, how this viscophobic turning that we observe um, competes with the fact that cells slow down in high viscosity. So these are two competing effects because the slowdown um, in high viscosity drives the cells toward the high viscosity zone. But obviously in this, in this, this effect that we observe here, um, the cells are biasing their motion away from that zone. So you have these, these, two, these two competing effects. Okay. So I have a naive question. Do, do chlamydomonas do rheotaxis? Do they do rheotax? So to fluid flows? Um, yes. Fluid flow, yes. Yeah. So um, there's, we actually had a paper on this a few years ago, I think 2015 in, in JSRI, um, where we, we looked at um, chlamydomonas swimming in a poise flow. Um, and what we observed there is that um, the these cells do some kind of a Jeffrey orbit, um, but not in the way that, that you would normally, normally think. So usually the Jeffrey orbit entails, you have an elongated object in shear. Um, and if you're shearing it this way, um, the object will kind of do this flipping motion like that. Um, it turns out that if you average over the conformations of the cell for Chlamydomonas, because it has these very long flagella, um, Chlamydomonas actually swims perpendicular to its elongated axis. And so there's this very strange effect where actually chlamydomonas will concentrate in the center of a poise flow. And that, this is all in this paper from, from 2015, which I can share. So in your, in your experiment of microfluidic device with three inlets, mm -hmm. you, you establish a concentration gradient and then you stop the flow. Oh, yes. And then let the concentration <laughs> gradient evolve. Precisely, yeah. So it's it's a it's sort of a stop flow assay, yeah. Good question. Sorry. Um, we have more questions. So from Emiliano Perez, do you think these results would be different for pushers and pullers? Um, will they be different? Um, probably yes. They will. There will be some nuanced. Um, uh, changes there. So we, we made one big assumption in our model, which is that um, the, in our model, we assume that the flagella are located exactly lateral to the center of drag of the cell. So we haven't really looked at what, what happens if you push those flagella forward or backward. Um, in a gradient, it makes it mathematically more complicated, but also much more interesting. Um, we know that there, we expect that there would be a difference if you have something like a biflagellate that we've looked at in this case versus an organism like, um, let's say a bacterium where the, the, the uh, propulsion apparatus is exactly in line with the cell. In that case, if the flagella are exactly in line with the cell body, 
then you would expect that the cells would actually um, exhibit positive viscotaxis. So they would sort of nosedive into the high viscosity zone. Um, and that comes purely from the fact that you have a differential drag on either side of the cell body. So if you just think about the, the, uh, the thought exercise of dragging a sphere through a viscosity gradient, right? So if you have high viscosity on this side and low viscosity on this side, um, as you drag that sphere, there will be a higher drag on the left side than the right side. And so it will rotate, right? And so if that's the cell that's being propelled in that direction, it will sort of nosedive into the high viscosity zone. So that's a test that you know, still needs to be done. <laughs>